Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Rob Meyer. I run Outbound Product Management here at GridGain. With me is Dennis Magda, who is in charge of inbound product management, among other things. He's also the Ignite, the Apache Ignite PMC chair. Today, uh, Dennis is going to be talking about the first in a series of topics around bringing Ignite into production starting with a checklist to help people get started. Uh, but before we jump into that, I want to make sure that we, everyone is ready and all set. So just a little bit of housekeeping. I want to make sure that you can hear me. So raise your hand uh, in the uh, go to webinar control panel. There's a little hand icon if you can uh, hear me. And if you can't, I don't know what you'll do, but we'll see what everybody does. So if you could just some of you Go click on the hand icon. There we go. So you folks can hear me. If at any time you have issues, I will be here to respond. I will also check up on the people that are raising some flags. I see one or two flags going up. I'll uh, I'll reach out to you once uh, once we are done with the introduction. But first, Let's get into the topic. So today we're we're kicking off a series around helping people uh, understand all the little details that they might have to go through as they go from starting their development with Apache Ignite for a particular type of project into moving it into production all the way to making it uh, a foundation for some business critical applications. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dennis Magna to get started. I will be answering questions along the way. So if you have any questions, feel free to go down to the questions window and uh, and type in your question and I'll start answering them. And I will I will start by looking at the few folks that seem to be having a couple issues. So feel free to fire away questions at any time. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dennis. Dennis it's been yeah, hello everyone. Uh, thanks Rob for the introduction. And as it was said today, we are going to start the series of our conversations related to Ignite deployments in production. Basically speaking, uh, what you need to think of once your development stage is over and you are moving into pre-production. So what will happen in pre production what can happen? What might not happen? There are many open questions uh, which can be floating in your head and you want to get them solved. And this series will try to address all of those questions. Uh, and we'll start today with uh, the so-called initial checklist, uh, which looks like this way. First of all, as long as Apache Ignite is a distributed system, uh, one of the prominent features of it is high availability and fault tolerance. Uh, but it also implies that you, as an application owner or an architect, has to consider several knobs or tuning parameters for your high availability and fault tolerance needs. So today we are going to review how to fine tune high availability and fault tolerance for your Ignite deployments. After that, uh, capacity planning and basic tuning related to the performance, usually we do this during the development stage, or at least at pre-production. But why it's, why it's so important for production deployments? Because you'd like to know how much data, uh, how much RAM space or how much disk space uh, is needed for your pre-production deployment initially, and, there, and then how fast you have to grow how fast you have to scale out if the data volume grows or the workload uh, are getting more intense. So that's why capacity planning is one of the important points in your checklist. Once once the cluster is in production, once your service is up and running, for sure we'd like to know what, are the, what would be our upgrades and patch procedures. Who will be supplying those patches and upgrades? Uh, and how quickly you can roll them out in your production environment. What are the best approaches to do that? And also, uh, depending on a use case, depending on an application or service, production support might be crucial, especially if you are in charge of a mission critical application. So here is also, I'll share some of the inputs on how you can get production support for your deployments. 
and for sure we'll have a decent amount of time for the q a session so feel free to ask the questions while uh, you're listening to this webinar as rap said he'll be responding to as many as he can if something is left unanswered we'll cover that uh, during the q a so before we dive into that uh, checklist uh, let's quickly uh, do that overview of Apache Ignite and also grid game because some of the uh, high availability settings or some of the upgrade related approaches support plans uh, are available or provided by grid game that's why here is on this picture I'd like to put an emphasis on what Ignite is and what grid game is so everything you can see in red is available in Apache Ignite and in Grid Game Community Edition. That's available free of charge, that's open source, you're free to use it the way you like, you're free to modify this code for your needs, etc. So, and there are kind of, there are many kind of components, right? You can see on this picture right in the middle. But primarily speaking, Ignite consists of two primary components. The first one is its distributed storage, uh, which can uh, keep the data both in memory and on disk and when it comes to disk you have two options uh, a third party existing database or ignite native persistence you're not going to get into the details today what's the difference between persistence options if you still don't know what's the primary difference just go to the uh, documentation or website pages to learn this and on top of this storage we have on top of this distributed storage we have a variety of apis SQL, key value, calculated computations, machine and data, deep learning, and all of that is free and all of that is open source. What grid gain adds on top of this is something which is uh, uh, prominent for enterprise deployments, for mission critical applications, things like full or incremental cluster backups or snapshots, or point in time recovery, rolling upgrades, data center replications, things like that. And all of these grid gain enterprise features are colored in blue on this diagram. All right, that's sort of a summary of what Apache Ignite is in terms of their capabilities and features and what grid gain adds uh, on top if to talk about the features. And now uh, going, jumping back to our primary topic of this uh, webinar, let's talk about high availability and fault tolerance. And here is I'd like to discuss high availability specific checklist. What you as an architect or an engineer has to keep in mind uh, before you are moving into the pre-production cycles. Because Ignite does a lot automatically. And sometimes you even don't need to move your hand. But also all of these things like replication factor or a number of backups for your data or rack awareness you need to keep them in mind also we'll see how persistence is useful why persistence is part of this high availability checklist cluster snapshots and point in time recovery that's for those who are using ignite native persistence and like to do safe uh, production upgrades and would like you know to have a copy of their data just in case if something can be corrupted due you know some hardware failures etc and data center replication is also part of the high availability checklist for those who would like to have multiple zones of availability. So what are the options, how to handle this? But let's start with the first and the most, uh, and the first and the simplest step which we need to take into account, replication factor, backups number. So what's the problem, right? Why we need to keep in mind that at least one redundant copy of the data is needed for your cluster. Let's take a look at this example. Here is we have a cluster of four nodes. And we have four partitions, partition zero, partition one, two, and three. And each node is a, stores a primary copy of a specific partition. And as we know, inside of partitions, inside of those partitions, we keep our actual data, our records, bank accounts, uh, purchases, and all of the other details so now what happens let's say that when one of the cluster nodes goes down in fact if that node goes down then they will lose partition one 
which means that effectively we lose all the data which sits in this partition. Uh, and now, like we have the cluster which is inconsistent, we don't have all the data available for us. We need to recover it somehow. Uh, to avoid these situations in production, the most, the simplest approach is just to increase your replication factor. As it's shown on this slide, we just need to set at least con cache configuration backups option to one, which will ensure that in addition to the primary copy of your partitions, each like there will be a backup copy of partitions distributed across the cluster. So now, if we take a look at this slide, let's say that we have partition zero. The primary copy of this partition is located on this node. And also there is a backup copy of the same partition, but now it's available on this node, node two. And now if we want to reproduce the same scenario, when this second node goes down and all of the data which was on this node will become unavailable, but as long as we have, as long as we have the primary copy of partition zero of this node on this node, and there is a backup copy of partition one on node three, our cluster, our applications will not get to the state when there is a data loss because cluster still has all the data needed and available for our application needs. And this node shutdown will not affect your cluster. Uh, availability or your applications availability. They will continue up and running without any issues. Because this node, node three, now will serve all of the requests to the data which is stored in partition one. And also after that, as long as we set this parameter, cache configuration backups equal to one, one of these nodes, node two or node two, will store a backup copy of partition one. So this copy will become the primary one, and one of these nodes automatically will become a backup node for partition one. And we will, and the cluster will enforce so-called uh, rebalancing process, so that the data is rebalanced to ensure your uh, replication factor. So that's the simplest approach. Now uh, let's talk about rack awareness. And first of all, I'd like to define this problem. What's 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 wrong with rack awareness? So here is when we are talking about the rack awareness. We can assume that uh, you can have your cluster distributed across several server racks, just physically two different uh, uh, racks located in the same building or in different buildings, or uh, those racks can be envisioned as different availability zones let's say on AWS. And you also try to deploy your single cluster across those two availability zones. So what's the problem with this deployment? If uh, you already do enable this replication factor, now here as we can see that for every primary copy of uh, our partitions, we have a backup copy across the cluster. But what might happen is that uh, one of the racks can become unavailable. It can just go down there, uh, or the switch can uh, can get disconnected from your application layer. And after that, this whole rack uh, will become unavailable for your applications. And what's wrong with this specific deployment? Partition two, primary copies of partition two and backup copy of partition two were stored on this rack, which means that now application, the application, cannot access this data. It's no longer available. And again, we are coming to this data loss scenario. What's the solution? Solution actually is pretty straightforward. If you know in advance that your Ignite cluster will be spanned across several server racks or different availability zones, uh, which are interconnected through different switches, et cetera, which are physically different uh, entities, uh, then do these simple configuration settings. First of all, uh, add special user attribute, like custom user attribute, like rec, rec number, uh, to configuration of your cluster nodes. For, inst for instance, all of the cluster nodes, which will be deployed in rec one, uh, needs to be labeled 
uh, has, uh, need to be labeled with this rec uh, one parameter. Rec two parameter will be used for the nodes to be available in the second availability zone or in the second rec. After you do these simple configuration settings for your cluster nodes, then from the code standpoint, you need to implement this simple filter for your affinity function, which distributes partitions and which distributes uh, the data which sits inside of that partitions. So, and this implementation is also pretty straightforward. I think that at some point of time, this will become part of the product and become available out of the box. But at least right now, you can just go ahead and copy and paste uh, this code snippet. So here is what happens. Uh, this code is executed by an affinity function whenever a partition uh, has to be assigned to a specific node. So here is what we are trying to do. We are taking uh, uh, this rec parameter of the current, current node where we'd like to locate a backup copy of partition. And here is we also trying to get what's uh, where is where is located the prime where where the primary copy of uh, this partition is located right now and if the regs are different then we are going to place uh, a backup copy of the partition on this node candidate rec if not then they are going to then the affinity function is going to continue until it finds a distribution when all of the primary nodes, all of the primary copies of partitions are stored separately from the backup copies of your partitions. And now let's try to reproduce the same scenario. Let's try to assume that we configured, we added that special user attribute to configuration settings of our cluster nodes. For instance, all of these two nodes, which will start on this rack one, they will have that rack one label in their configuration. And this node will have uh, rec2 label respectively. And after that, we just changed, you know, we enabled that filter for our affinity function. So now let's try to assume that the same scenario happens. This switch goes down and the application can longer access this rec, but we, we did not uh, lose any data because if you count all of the partitions here, these two nodes uh have all of the partitions needed for your application to continue uh kind of to continue serve all of your requests so we have all this data in this node in this rack so that's how simple you can arrange this and this and again this works for on-premise deployments for your private data centers where you have different server racks and also this the same technique can be applied for cloud deployment like Microsoft Azure or AWS when it comes to availability zones. So keep this in mind. Next uh, action item in your high availability checklist is persistence. Uh, because yeah, Ignite, Ignite is in memory, is in memory databases, in memory uh, platform, uh, which is optimized for uh, memory intensive workloads, etc. But also it's highly unlikely uh, that anybody will go in production without any persistence option. Because the cluster, there, are, there might be situations when your cluster needs to be restarted or can go, can go down, right? Uh, and that's why persistence is still needed, at least as a backup for your data. And whenever it comes to the persistence options, you have two choices, right? The first one is uh, an existing database. And here is this configuration. Uh, it's shown here is to the left. It's usually uh, applied for uh, scenarios where you are adapting Ignite in your for your architecture. Let's say that you have your relational database, you have some performance bottlenecks, and you'd like to accelerate your uh, database with in-memory computing layer, uh, and you go ahead and deploy Ignite in between your applications and the database, and Ignite writes down all the changes to your relational database. And this configuration, that's like a perfect configuration. Ignite will for sure boost your read operations. Uh, you, are, you will get a uh, horizontally scalable solution. And also this relational database will be continued. You will continue to use it uh, 
as a backup storage, as persistent storage. So when, if by some reason, you need to restart your Ignite cluster or this whole cluster goes down, then you will be able to recover all the data from, relation, from your, let's say, relational database. You will be able to preload it in memory. Another option is Ignite Native Persistence. Uh, and here is, uh, uh, we see it's being adopted a lot and used for new modern architectures, for greenfield applications. Whenever, when you usually start without any dependency on a third party persistence like relational database and you just like to get uh, in memory computing to be deployed in your environment and you'd like to have transactional persistence, which guarantees at least similar to relational databases. And here is uh, what are the like what's why why which uh, which persistence to select again if you already have an existing legacy architecture and you need to uh, accelerate it with Ignite then start with this architecture start with this approach because we don't want you to disrupt your existing applications. Then at some point of time, if you'd like to turn off this database, if it's no longer needed, you can always enable transactional persistence. At the same time, if you have, if you're just starting a new application and you are not obliged to use it, uh, any third-party database, then also consider Ignite. So what's the differences uh, here? Like what are the benefits of transactional persistence of Ignite? First of all, it's distributed, which means that you are optimizing not only read operations but also writes. Uh, next, you don't need to store entire entire data set in RAM. Transactional persistence will keep 100% of your data on disk across a cluster of machines, and you are free to cache in memory as much as you can, or as much as you want, or as much as you can afford. It's up to you. For instance, uh, this capability, if to give, share some stories with you, this capability allows to enable so-called hybrid transactional and analytical uh, processing scenarios. When let's say memory, when you store 100% of uh, data, both in memory and on disk for your operational or hard data, and uh, only a small fraction of memory is used for your analytical or historical data sets. That's what you can do. And finally, based on this capability of storing a subset of data in RAM, uh, with Ignite Native Persistence, you are getting instantaneous restarts, which increases your high availability tremendously. Let's say that your Ignite cluster went down by some reason, and now you need to restart it. Once all of the nodes are interconnected, you don't need to wait, your applications don't need to wait while the memory is preloaded or warmed up. Uh, applications will be enabled right away, and Ignite will read all the data and serve all the data from disk preloading and roaming up memory and background, which tremendously uh, reduces your downtime if it happens. With relational databases or any other third-party persistence, you have to warm up your memory, especially if you use SQL, Compute Grid, and many other APIs. All right, that's persistence. What's next? Uh, for sure, backups, right, and recovery management. If you're using your relational database or any other storage, then for sure, uh, even though Ignite uh, persists all the changes to your relational database, uh, then don't forget this to make uh, frequent backups of your relational database. Usually we do this all the times because hardware uh, can be corrupted, right? And then you need to restore your uh, database files. And the same story applies to uh, Ignite Native Persistence, even though this persistence is scalable, it's transactional, we have write ahead logs files to ensure consistency. Uh, but it can happen that uh, your solid state drives uh, can, can they can, can can become exhausted. They can just uh, the data can be corrupted, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Several exceptions might happen. That's why it's always uh, good to have an ability to make a cluster backups, backups of your ignite data. And here is uh, grid gain provides uh, centralized backup and recovery management capabilities for Ignite Native Persistence. So if you're using Ignite Native Persistence in production, uh, you can take a look at these uh, backups and snapshots capabilities. So you can do full and incremental snapshots. Uh, we do so-called continuous archiving in point-in-time recovery. With point-in-time recovery, 
curious signature and interesting like use case why uh, it's useful and how for instance it, it it was used for several production scenarios let's say that you are uh, rolling out a new version of your application and by some reason some kind of bug sneaked into that uh, application version and once this application went in production you it's it, it, uh, you uh, uh, you do an uh, incremental like and full uh, backup and after that you kind of keep running doing some incremental snapshots you do continuous recovery etc but then at some point of time this uh, bug uh, fires off and it corrupts some of the data just like just removes some of the data from your cluster etc who knows like what can happen and now you need to restore your data and here is point in time recovery can help a lot if you know at what time uh, this bug fired off in your application and removed all the data, then you can use the latest full and incremental snapshots and all the latest write-ahead log files of the cluster nodes to recover to that second when that bug fired off. And you can restore the data to that state. You don't need to roll back to the latest full or incremental snapshot, losing a lot of the changes. You can roll back to specific point in time and that's what you can get with point in time recovery and finally for those who are deploying uh, their clusters across just uh, different data centers not just you know availability zones uh, which are located in close proximity but those availability zones or data centers which are far away from each other for that scenarios usually nobody would suggest you to deploy a span a single ignite cluster let's say that it, it will be it can be an overkill if you try to deploy a single ignite cluster which nodes are located both in east and west coast and if you'd like to have but if you'd like to have different data centers in east coast and west coast and you'd like to have a backup data center then consider multi-data center replication Again, this is provided for enterprise solutions and for mission critical applications and available uh, from grid gain. So here is the idea is pretty simple. Uh, active policy for active active replication uh, between your uh, Ignite clusters, by direction, etc. It works, it's being used in production. So if by some reason you are required to enable this multi-data center replication and you're looking for a software solution, uh, which will work for both Ignite and Git Gain cluster, then have a look at this. All right, so we are done with high availability. So this high availability, that's the first step you need to do before we even decide to uh, kind of to sign off our pre-production testing saying that we are good to go. So keep in mind, backups, increase your replication factor, then rack awareness, that's for those who are having multiple racks or multiple availability zones for their Ignite clusters, then persistence is for sure, is a requirement because even though the cluster will stay high available, highly available, but what unpredictable happens, right? And the whole cluster can go down and we'd like to recover data from this. And then for those who are using Ignite Native Persistent, then we have to keep in mind that you also need to make full and incremental snapshots and data center replication and for those who are running across uh, different data centers. So capacity planning, the next uh, basic tuning. So here is we'd like to talk and cover some of the suggestions related, like how many nodes. Usually, uh, what what's the question which uh, triggers this conversation? How many nodes do I need for my production deployments? Or how much RAM per machine I need for my production deployments? Uh, there is no any. Uh, there is no one answer because it all depends on your use case but how do you approach and how do you answer this question for yourself right uh, first of all do capacity planning even before you uh, write a single line the first line of code for your ignite deployments and here is we can ignite community uh, simplify that step for you use our capacity calculator which is basically just a spreadsheet uh, which uses some of their uh, special formula when you input your preferred server configuration your uh, ram space per node disk space per node and how much uh, memory you have right now 
in your current system. And then we are using some of the parameters to estimate how many nodes of this kind you need for your uh, production deployment. After you do this, at least you will have some you know, basic understanding of how many uh, cluster machines are required for this deployment. So just go to this documentation page and there you will find the reference to this Google Sheet. So do this for your, before you kind of sign off your pre-production test. After that, uh, what you have to size, what you have to estimate. First of all, uh, in Ignite we distinguish two different memory spaces, off heap space and Java heap space. Off heap space is utilized for your data and indexes. So whatever you put in Ignite, whatever you store in Ignite, it will be located in that of heap region. And it's unlimited. I mean, like basically there are no any limitations because it's not in Java heap and it's not uh, vulnerable uh, for the scenarios when you have Java garbage collection produce because it's, it's just not Java heap. And if you'd like to estimate this off heap space, first of all, sure, use this capacity flat a capacity calculator to get the first rough numbers. And after that, just do basic uh, data loading into your cluster. And you will see uh, how correct uh, the calculator was. After that, you might need to adjust some of your estimates, but at least do the initial load of your data. If you can load the whole data set, which will be used uh, in production, that's perfect. And also once you kind of take this capacity calculator estimates and you do the first load, of your data, then you will be able to predict uh, how quickly you need to scale out your cluster. Let's say if you're going to store two, time, uh, two times more data, three times more data. So you will have that formula for your specific use case. It's always specific for your use case. And as for the Java heap size, that's also again specific for your use case and your applications. Uh, and we store temporarily objects there, something which is being generated by your application workloads. You're running SQL queries, you're running key value operations. All of these queries, for sure, will get data from off heap, but all of those result sets, all of the uh, objects uh, that are used during the lifetime of your queries uh, will be placed in the, in, the, in the Java heap. So again, here is to estimate the Java heap size, again, do load test. Test your system, do load test, run your application specific benchmarks, and you will see what's the best and what's the right Java heap space size for you. Uh, for sure, there are some of the kind of rules like don't go beyond 32 gigabytes per cluster node because otherwise you can get into a long running garbage collection poses, etc. But usually speaking, as long as the whole data set and indexes are sitting, in off heap, and as long as you can scale out your cluster as much as you'd like, usually Java heap, you know, below 32 gigabyte RAM is something you will not you will not see. Usually, in my in my practice, the heap size is around you know five, ten, or fifteen like gigabyte per node. But do the load test to be to, to know like what exactly you need. And also this calculator, etc. Uh, whenever you will be calculating, keep in mind that you are aware of high availability principles we discovered so far. You also need to uh, keep a copy, keep the whole copy of your data, a backup copy of your data. And also uh, you will be keeping data on persistence. That's just part of our uh, high availability and fault tolerance conversation. And after that, uh, that's more specific for your production workloads, get ready to them. Uh, whenever you're just, you know, selecting, whenever we are selecting um, a solution for our application, yes, all of those, you know, vendor-specific benchmarks, which are available publicly, uh, uh, they are pretty good rough estimate, uh, but whenever it comes to your uh, scenario, don't judge by those publicly available vendor-specific uh, papers. Go and benchmark your solution. You need to know like what would be the latency, what would be the throughput for your environment, because it will help you to tune your memory, persistence, garbage collection, and many other parameters. And here is, if you go to Apache Ignite, preparing for production documentation section, you'll find a lot of the inputs and tips and tricks, how to do that, like what to do and what not. A lot of tests for sure, again, it will help you to estimate 
also it will be helpful for your capacity planning and to estimate your growth rate how fast you have to scale out your cluster but do the load testing do a benchmark uh inch parks be ready for production right uh my suggestion you don't want to have any surprises in production because usually in production you have to react instantaneously and if you're prepared for that then you will be able to fix uh an issue and save a lot of the money uh, for your company next upgrades and patching all right now we we'll know what to do in terms of high availability what to do what not also hopefully this capacity planning guidance and uh, workload specific uh, benchmarks and load tests are helpful now let's say that we are already in production or we're about to launch our first application so how can we how are we going to upgrade our cluster? Yes, for sure, we certainly know how to update our applications. But at the same time, uh, how are we going to upgrade Ignite? Who is going to deliver all of those uh, bug fixes and patches for us? Because that's still a software. And the, and the software uh, is evolving over the time. And that's true for Ignite or Green Game. So first of all, if you're using a patch Ignite in production, then prepare for full cluster restarts if you need to upgrade Ignite version. So Ignite versions are incompatible, which means that you cannot have in the same cluster Ignite of version 2.6 and 2.7. You have to have only one, which means that whenever you're planning to upgrade that Ignite cluster, then just stop your cluster, update the binaries, restart your cluster, and then also do the same for your application. So this, yes, this implies uh, downtimes and like, but usually a lot of the companies, especially those solutions who are not on a mission critical path, they can, you know, find some maintenance window window to do this upgrade. As for the patching and bug fixes, again, if you're an Apache Ignite user, the Ignite community uh, tries to release as many as frequently as possible, but usually that's like our best effort. We don't have any specific uh, roadmap, etc. We are trying to release it depending on like on our availability, but usually we try to do this as soon as possible because the community and the development is pretty active. Also for those who'd like to uh, stick to the open source for the free paradigm, and don't want to have, uh, don't want to pay for any enterprise licenses, you have an option of switching to again community edition. Community edition is again also source available version of Apache Ignite uh, uh, and it comes with a much more frequent maintenance releases and uh, much earlier availability of bug fixes and performance improvements. So and here is at Gridgain uh, we are trying to release community edition at least monthly. So and you will be able to use it free of charge, not paying anything to us. So that's an option for you if you'd like to get uh, any patches or bug fixes on a monthly basis. And when it comes to the enterprise approaches, if there is any of you who are on the mission critical path or you cannot afford any maintenance window so at all, uh, then here is uh, the only one option I can suggest you is to consider uh, grid gain rolling upgrades and again cluster snapshots for those who are using native persistent. And so the upgrade procedure roughly will look like this way. If you're using Ignite native persistence, first uh, make a cluster snapshot because you just anything can happen, right? Something something can go wrong and you can lose your data. We don't want this to happen, even though we are try, we are testing rolling upgrades hard and we ensure that they are and this feature is one of the most stable in our product. After that, use rolling upgrades. And these, you're just upgrading each node one by one. You start, you stop one node, you update, create gain version there, you bring it up, it joins the cluster, you will have nodes of different versions coexist at the same point of time. And then you repeat the same procedure for each given, for each existing node until your whole cluster is uh, migrated to the new version. And this also helps you to sustain to that, helps you to provide this 24 by seven 
availability and to avoid any maintenance windows, windows for deployments. And this feature is available for enterprise and ultimate editions. So keep this in mind. And finally, all right, so what's next? Now we selected what would be our upgrades and patching procedures. We decided how we are going to get all of those patches and bug fixes for our production deployments. But what's about support? What if like, if there is something, uh, you know, specific uh, for our application, we need to get an advice, we need to fix, we need to optimize, there are performance bottlenecks, there are some memory issues, like memory usage issues. You might have a lot of the answers and much more answers will come once you go in production. Yes, we are asking a lot, we are studying a lot whenever we are developing, then we are, when we are moving into the pre-production stage, we are in a sort of, you know, state when we think we know a lot and we are confident to go in production. And once we apply all of those suggestions above, uh, we can go in production before, but also once you're in production, uh, you know, questions or issues, uh different questions and issues can arise and that can require different level of expertise and you what's important you have to fix and address all of those questions uh much quicker than in pre prot or development cycles so and here is again what are the options for apache ignite community right uh if you think that like ignite community user list is fine absolutely like uh here is uh i also personally uh, checking this user list and helping our open source uh, community with some of the questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we, everyone on the Apache Ignite community, does it on his or best effort. Whenever we have time, whenever we have, uh, we'd like to check what's going on. Whenever we want to see like what are some of the issues being reported by the community, we do this. Uh, but whenever it comes to production issues, sometimes we know that it cannot wait. Right? Well, someone uh, on the community list does us a favor in response to our question etc which is critical for our scenario and here is again you have an option if you prefer to use apache ignite as open source solution it's just totally fine uh, you can work with grid gain experts who provide unlimited web and email support for ignite deployments because we are building ignite as well be one of the uh, biggest contributors to apache ignite we contribute to it we are uh, interested in its involvement and like we are ready to share our knowledge with you so you can consider this option for your ignite deployments those who need something uh suitable for enterprise deployments for mission critical applications so here is uh what you can get from grid gain uh, you can get standard community support for grid gain community edition so you're not paying for community edition but you can uh, get support for it not just web or email support, but also uh, phone support 24 by 7. And also enterprise and ultimate edition absolutely go with standard and premium options. All right. So generally speaking, that's the first initial checklist, right? Which I'd like, which I wanted to share with you and to ensure that you are getting ready uh, for your first production deployments. With Apache Ignite. If you're already in production, then hopefully some of these suggestions will help you to harden your existing deployments so that the next time when you will come to an upgrade cycle, you will be able to uh, solidify your high availability uh, settings or you will be able to come up with a, a better uh, upgrades procedure, etc. etc. But also, what's to expect next? Because as we said, that's the series of the webinars. Uh, the next two topics will be covering, first, first topic uh, will be covering native persistence and data recovery. So you will learn from the architects and developers and engineers of those, those who develop native persistence and snapshots for Ignite and Grid. And you will learn how to tune, how to optimize native persistence for production deployments, and how to enable this data recovery, how to use snapshots, point in time recovery, pros and cons. So that's the first topic. Another one is like monitoring Ignite. What are the best tools? What are the best approaches? How to do this? How to do that? Also, grid gain experts are going to share their knowledge with you because we are helping to maintain not only grid gain deployments in production, but also a lot of Apache Ignite deployments in production. And here is we just would like to uh, share our experience with you so 
all of these webinars will be scheduled throughout June and July this year. So keep an eye, uh, subscribe to our emails, and you'll you'll be notified once these two webinars are scheduled. Uh, saying that, uh, that's it for this presentation, and I'm I'll be happy to answer your questions. All right, so a few questions have come in. Uh, I will play them in no particular order. The first question is, uh, for those starting out in cloud, are there any uh, recommendations you have for setting up, let's say, an Amazon or Google or Azure uh, for security um, or Docker and Kubernetes? You know, What would be your first choice in configuration if you were setting up in in, uh, in a VPN in, uh, as a mm -hmm. private cloud configuration. Yeah, so here is, uh, I would say that we don't have any cloud specific recommendations. So if you need to just deploy your uh, Ignite or Gain cluster in some VPN, in your private VPN, just, just go ahead and deploy it together with your applications. This VPN will protect you from outside, right? At the same time, if you'd like to uh, enforce something like authorization or authentication per application uh, layer level, when it's uh, when let's say some of the applications are allowed to modify and read data from your cluster, but the others can only read a subset of the data. For that sake, uh, check out uh, grid gain security framework. It also can be used. You can be an Ignite user, but then if you'd like to in, enforce that security, authentication, authorization, LDAP, Kerberos, etc., something specific for the cloud, you can use the security framework. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's what I have right now to share. Okay. Uh, second question, uh, just from what you've seen in deployments. How much uh, over capacity would you budget for, uh, for for people who don't quite know how much they need to index or um, for data growth? Do you have any recommendations on how much extra uh, RAM or sizing they should add, or should they should they grow a cluster in different ways by just uh, assuming they're going to add more nodes? What's your recommendation mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. So here is, I would say that my generic advice would be is uh, how quickly you can scale out your cluster if you are uh, going beyond your RAM capacity. So for instance, and that will be, I think, part of this will be covered in our next monitoring uh, uh, episode. But generally speaking, if you have some, if you monitor your cluster and you see that uh, your memory consumption is getting to some critical level, then you can just scale out your cluster or you can execute, you can have some automatic scripts that will detect the situation and will scale out your cluster out of the box, even not involving your uh, DevOps. So basically speaking, if you can kind of, let's say, if you can quickly, rather quickly do that, not affecting your production employment, then just rely on your uh, DevOps. Uh, settings on your monitoring capabilities, on alerting and triggers. At the same time, uh, if you cannot answer this question or you just still would like to have some overhead, uh, then again, try try to just try to have at least uh, allocate 20% or 30% uh, more space for your Java heap because your kind of your Java workloads, your kind of workload uh, throughput can grow, right? Who knows? And also for the off heap space, also probably something around 20 or 30 percent. I'm just, you know, uh, throwing out these numbers out of my head because my summary is, you know, 20 or 30 percent sounds reasonable to me. But also just never rely on this fixed number, and also try to set up the monitoring and triggers for your production environment. Okay. Third question is. Um... Does it make more sense to set up active active or or active warm cold up front, or is it pretty easy to set up later on down the road? What's your recommendation there? 
so here is uh, to my knowledge it doesn't it doesn't actually make sense uh, but generally speaking if I'm not mistaken there are some of the parameters in our data center replications which have to be done uh, before you go in, before you deploy your cluster and some of them can be done dynamically for instance uh, settings like new caches which you'd like to replicate which you'd like to stop replicating all of those changes can be done in the right time so you don't need you know to come up with a final list of your caches and tables for your clusters uh, before you enable the replication you can always adjust those settings in the right time when it comes to the active active or active passive mode if I'm not mistaken, this is something which you have to do right now before you go into production. So you need to enable this uh, first, and, uh, and if you'd like to change this in the runtime, most likely you need you know, to shut down the replication, change the settings, and then re-enable the replication. So that's my current assumption. Okay, sounds like a good future topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, well, those are the biggest questions I saw. Uh, a couple others got answered along the way. So, Dennis, uh, on behalf of everyone, want to thank you for going through the checklist and looking forward to the next uh, the next sets of webinars in the series. You're welcome.